and welcome to another evening of Frank Conversation here on Hard Copy, coming to you from our studios in Abuja. I'm Maupe Ogunyusuf. No doubt for politicians and even for many Nigerians, this is going to be one of the most long drawn out campaign seasons they've ever witnessed giving room for fatigue or a shift of attention from the pressing issues currently bedeviling Nigerians. Now, given the complexity of the problems facing us, some of which include security, the economy, and environmental issues, the time frame could either provide an opportunity for deeper engagement with the candidates at national and subnational levels, or give room for those currently saddled with the responsibility of fixing our problems time to hide. After all, elections are almost upon us. One thing is certain, though. While citizens continue to find ways to make a living, who will lead them at the national and subnational levels continue to dominate discussions? And while these discussions happen, we want to take a drill down on one of the states, which historically has played a decider in previous presidential elections. Kano State is to northern Nigeria, and the country is bordering it what Lagos is to Nigeria, an economic nerve center. Its politics has always been interesting, too. As of 2019, Kano had co a confirmed figure of over 5 million registered voters. In the newly completed voter registration by INEC, Kano has the largest number of new voters in the Northwest region, with over half a million people completing their registration. How will these people at the polls decide who will lead them in their state? And how would they play at the federal level? My guest tonight is no stranger to the politics of Kano. Mwazu Magiji is an engineer, activist, and politician. He served both PDP and APC governments in the state and recently aspired to be governor of the great state of Kano. Mwazu Magaji, welcome to Hard Copy. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Mope. Well, you do hail from an interesting and dynamic state, and you attempted to, you know, lead them re only recently. You bought the PDP governorship form. Correct. What happened to that mission? Well, basically, you know, it's a democratic process, so yeah. I sign on to it. I know the outcome will be that uh, there is going to be an exercise, and there's going to be a winner. Mm. And the primary election is one of the bottleneck of our democracy. There were attempts to modify the rules and give peoples the power to choose whom they want uh, by basically uh, proposing a direct or indirect primaries, a modification to the indirect primaries. It went all the way to the president's desk and for some reason best known to the stakeholders and the president, he just didn't sign it on. I felt personally... The president? Yes. The Mr. president of what? Mr. President. Oh, okay. Mr. President... That's uh, you the know, electoral yes, act yes, now. Yes, exactly. The electoral act contained modification yeah. that could have changed the process of the primaries, reduced the influence of many, mm -hmm. and then also make choice a little wider and more broader to mm -hmm. the public. So we went through the old style process of uh, primaries through the delegate system. And as you know, uh, it is widely known that it's very tightly managed system mm -hmm. with a lot of influence of many uh, stakeholders. And uh, if you are not uh, one of those who stash so much money, mm. you tend to uh, lose out. So you and went all the way to the primary. I went all the way to the primary. Do you think that the indirect system played against you? Yes, exactly. And I got, I got a very sizable amount of votes that I'm very proud of. For, for one reason, mm -hmm. before the primaries, I made it very clear I will not buy votes. I did not come to be part of the problem. I did not come to Nigerian politics and uh, join the government to contribute to the problem that I saw from outside. I came from corporate environment, and I felt like my participation should make a difference rather than reinforce the status quo. So I didn't. But I got very beautiful votes that I'm very proud of, mm -hmm. and I thank those delegates that voted for me without uh, in any form of inducement uh, because they believe in what we, we preached and what we uh, um, campaigned on. But at the end, it's a democracy. We sign on to it. We accept the outcome. And uh, we're going to pray very hard that we will have a peaceful transition. It's interesting that you cite money politics as one of the things that played against you. Correct. Because the people of Kano, I mean, they've been cited as one of the most dynamic set of voters you can ever find anywhere. Correct. Uh, you know, there was the elections in 2003 where... Uh, then lecturer um, uh, tried to Ibrahim Shekarao. Shekarao. Yes, yes, indeed. You know, won the, the elections against an incumbent governor of the state. Correct. So, so 
Um, you know, it, it's interesting that you talk about money playing um, a role in, 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 in how voters also go. So I, does, I, does money really influence voters? Yes. In, yeah, no, in no, no, no. Uh, so there are two stages. Like I started this introduction by saying a bottleneck in our democracy is the primary election. Okay. I can tell you something. If I had gone through the primaries and I decided maybe I could buy my way, if I subject myself to the public in Kanu, a lot of things will have been different. So the problem is the party that I have chosen to aspire on, it's a party of stakeholders. It's a party with a history of bringing money into its processes. And that's the People's Democratic Party. That's the People's Democratic Party. Yeah, that is, that's the history of the party. And unfortunately for me, I felt I could survive the primaries. I could make it to the primaries by a logical reason of stakeholders that they're looking for a candidate that can deliver in the general election. But it didn't turn out to be so. It, it, bec it became a space allocation. And I accept that. So I miss the primaries, but I can tell you, in the general election, nobody can buy Kano voters. Nobody. It is our history. It's our legacy. And we have been living up to it. And I can assure you, 2023, it will also be there. We will see it happen. It did. I mean, a lot of people always make reference to how, uh, for instance, the current president has always earned some of his biggest votes in Kano. And, and this, is for, for, this is played out for the longest of times. Absolutely. Uh, but moving on now in 2023, mm. he will not be on the ballot. Kano is looking very interesting. Uh, from what you can see from the permutations, where do you think the love of the voters of Kano would lie? So we have to look at the pedigree of Kano politics. Mm -hmm. That means uh, if you look at what are they affiliated to, what is their affinity? Mm -hmm. It's a progressive state, historically. But it has also a very heavy component of conservative stakeholders. So, for example, if you look at, uh, let's start from Mala Amina Kano School of Thought. That is the crucible from which most of the political actors in Kano gain their progressive ideals. And Abu Bakar for example, sprang from that platform, became a progressive leader, joined the progressive team in Nigeria, played his progressive politics, and created a lot of momentum in kind of development. Even Rabi Musa Konkosu, his second coming, I wouldn't say the same for the first coming, 1999-2003, that's when he lost because he kind of didn't define himself very well. But in his second coming, he studied where he missed his opportunity, is to define who he was and basically take that space. And he defined it properly. He became a basically custodian of the progressive ideal of Kano politics in 2011, and he won that election again. Now, coming back to today, we could now start saying, where are the progressive space and where are the conservative space? Mike, you, if the progressive also makes mistakes, Kano people also leave them. That was what happened with Conquest in 2003. And Malin Ibrahim Shekarou is not from the progressive camp. Is from the conservative camp. He was sponsored by progressive elements, I mean, conservative elements, the business community, the traditional rulers, the Islamic scholars. This group came together and looked for a candidate. But one thing with Kanu is you must have a saleable candidate. Mm -hmm. Amana Ibrahim Shekarawi came out humble, experienced, and very amiable to the public. And when you go to election space, I can assure you, you can campaign anything in Kanu. People will make their choices based on how they feel about those two spaces. The good thing about Kano is there is no guarantee that one space will take precedence over the other. Mm. It depends on what the actors in the space does. Because progressive have lost election, conservative have won election, and conservative have lost election. So going forward today, Kano is a toss-up state. From national politics, it is about the strategy of the four political parties. Four, I mean the four major ones. Um, Rabbi Musakunkosu from Kanu has an advantage, but he also has his own issues related to his own style of politics in the state that people in the state know about that are not happy with. And Atiku is from the north, but his northern affiliation doesn't come out strong as a political advantage to a point where people will say, oh, I'm voting for a northerner. Uh, Ahmed it's interesting you say that because, I mean, PDP 
Um, it's not a, it's going to be his first time contesting in, in Correct. Kano. Sure, I mean, sure. But if you look at his history, over time, he has not been doing very well in Kano for two reasons. Mm -hmm. One, his northern identity is not very well defined. And then second, he has problem with the type of politics that I'm explaining. He comes out as a very ultra-capitalist candidate and kind of prefer a little more progressive people. So we, I think he has a lot of work to do. He knows that. He went to kind of spend days, engage the... So he knows the category of people he's engaging. If you are very strategic when you go to Kano, define who you are and don't waste your time or money on the other side. Concentrate on the side that you belong and get as many volunteers that will work for you, that believe in you. And I think that's what Atiku is doing right now. The other space is Bolaime Tunubu. He has two advantages, in my view, in Kanu. The first advantage is that there is the Muslim ticket. I mean, not the Muslim Muslim ticket. The fact that he's a Muslim, Kanu is a also ultra conservative Muslim state. It gives an advantage. However, we do not base our politics on only religion. We interrogate the candidate. So why I say he has two advantages is that Bola Ahmed Tenubu is from the progressive camp. So when Atiku goes to the other camp, Bola Ahmed Tenubu have the other camp to engage, the progressive camp, because his history of progressive politics led to the major, which formed the APC, and also, if you look at what he has done in Lagos and the people he, are, he has groomed, they are center-left progressive politicians. So it appeals to people of Kano. So I, I, I'm, I'm saying it's going to be very interesting. Labour Party missed a golden opportunity. They have? Yes. Labour Party made an erode in Kano through an ultra-conservative candidate from the north. Why do I say that? The Labour Party will have been a little more left-wing of APC, which will almost coincide with PRP philosophy, which means uh, blue-collar job, middle-class economy, progressive uh, political ideology, uh, workers' party, you know, that would have been the ideological space. However, there are northern candidate. When you look at his setting, he doesn't project those images. Now, why do you think that in this instance, because for the major other candidates you have analyzed, you have spoken about the presidential candidate, not their vice presidential candidate. Yes. Why do you think that in the case of Labour Party, the vice presidential candidate is important? Because he is the one from the north and the northwest. He is the one that, unfortunately, this is what Peter Obi also did. And I think, I don't know who led him to do that decision. When he went to the north, he was looking for a representation of the northern space. He went to the Northern Elders Forum, an ultra-conservative body of uh, northern elders who basically decide things for northern Nigeria. I agree. But when they go into politics, they also made one mistake. Instead of getting a neutral candidate with a similarity with Peter Obi's background that can preach those attributes I talked about for Labour Party, they gave their own siblings. And in northern Nigeria, we are aristocratic in nature. We also don't like imposition of politicians like aristocracy. And that is also the problem Congresso is struggling with in Kano, which led him to get a lot of erosion of space in 2019 that led to the loss of 2019 because he gave his ill the ticket. And this is becoming very common in northern Nigeria now. People are planting their children, people are planting their ill people are planting the siblings of their wives in political office. Because How we are successful are they, are they in as candidates, those people? Yes. as candidates? Are they usually successful in trying to install them? So, because primary election is a stakeholder space, they install them anyway, irrespective, whether it's use of money or it's use of relationship clan politics. But the eventual outcome is yet to be out. For 2019, we have seen ABBA in Kano did not make it. And we know that Congress's support base will have been much better without that imposition. In 2023, there are gamuts of candidates that have those attributes. So we're going to wait and see whether Northern Nigeria will confer those aristocracy tendencies, the office of political democracy as an inheritance or as a heritage.
And we're waiting to see the outcome. It's not out yet. I personally believe it's not the right way to go. And I believe that Northern Nigeria will try to avoid and clearly separate the respect for aristocracy, which is inheritance-based leadership, and democracy, which is basically giving people with capacity, relationship, achievement, knowledge, the ability to lead their people based on what they can bring in. And it's rotational. When you come in, you play your role. And when you finish, you step out and give chance to another person who God gave the same attribute. So, well, I mean, we have quite a bit of time. We're still in November now. Mm -hmm. uh, November, December, January. Polls are supposed to take place in February. It's looking like four months. Uh, from your own assessment and what you know of Nigerian politics, um, is this good or bad? So we haven't had this long six months or more period. So it's still... So a, planned. We, we have had six months. I mean, in because 2019, of, postponement. Because of postponement, yes. yes. But this was a planned, deliberate period. Yes. We haven't seen the impact this is bringing yet to the decision of the people because we haven't gone to the poll. But this is what I, I will say. From observation... There is fatigue, there is resource challenges. Candidates with little capacity to mobilize resource will be exhausted or have been exhausted already. And they may be good candidates. They may be very good candidates. And the big problem, apart from primary election bottleneck, is our fundraising mechanism in our politics is also not very good. It relies on the ability of the individual to get money whichever way mm -hmm. and not the public contributing and holding accountable. However, we have done that with Buhari as well. And see where we are. We can't hold the people accountable irrespective of the contribution. We lost it day one when he said he doesn't belong to us. He belongs to nobody. <laughs> so now, I think the long period of time is both an opportunity and a challenge. Opportunity in the sense that the candidate now have time to go around engage the public, explain their manifestos and their programs. The public have opportunity to interrogate the candidate. Are we really seeing that? Something we have not done before. Yes, are we, are we really seeing that, considering the level of engagement that we're seeing already? So, so the point is, you mentioned something in the introduction. Candidates are hiding. I think candidates are waiting for Christmas to be over. For that new year, they will take a very active public space so that the three months to election will be more dynamic. Let me ask you again, let me take you back to uh, the Labour Party candidate, because you initially had, uh, you know, given him some uh, reason to hope, especially Correct. in a place like Kano. Correct. Um, they had sought partnership with the... Uh, with uh, the NNPP. NNPP, yes. And they say, oh, even though he, ha he didn't work initially... They say the door is not closed for they're a still partnership. Talking, yes. Yeah, they're still talking. Uh, what sort of mergers do you think could come out of that talk and what opportunities lie there? I honestly think that, honestly, in my view, as a generational uh, advocate, a leadership advocate, they missed an opportunity. Because the combination of these two represent a step change in the leadership model Nigeria was looking for. If you look at Peter Obi and why I gave him that pass back and the hope I had was that he came out strong as a change agent. Even though he belonged to the leadership cycle that would have ideally be part of the problem. But he was able to successfully prove that he was conscious of what he was doing and continuously sail through the problems without getting enmeshed in it. And now when he speak, he speak with a clarity that he has an idea of what to do to get out of this problem. And we were all very impressed. It is the second component of his complement in, in the running back that doesn't come out, in my view, as a change agent. So the northern flank lost momentum because the element also, the problem is it became a rifle effect. Mm. Because of the nature of the individual and because Fida will be giving the power to decide things in the north, the people he looked for to also help him are his kinds. So that space became a lot more conservative rather than progressive, rather yeah. than the same point of view. Yeah, but looking at... Uh, but when you come back to, yeah, to the Konkosu, opportunities, yeah. Konkosu coming in, 
to join Peter Obi. Should he have been his vice presidential candidate? So, so I said it from day one. Yes. Because I have had a little bit of idea of how Peter Obi moved out of PDP and became a Labour Party candidate from his cycle. And I have worked with Congress. From day one, I said the problem will be who will be what in this partnership. They are very similar. They are literally a mirror image of each other. Even in their uh, governorship history, it's similar. Congress have not really allowed himself to be messed up in matters of the state and governance like we are witnessing in Kano today. A lot of scandal here, a lot of scandal here, a lot of scandal here. He hasn't allowed his family to get into governance and cause a lot of ripples in terms of how accountability management is discussed like we have today in Kano. So because he has done that, he can come out and say, I have an idea of how to get Nigeria out of its problem. And he can be believed, just like Peter Obi. But because it's not about age or it's about seniority, like Ekwemi was to Shagari, it is time for us to reciprocate and then partner with Peter Obi to heal the country, to move the country forward, and to have a more progressive change platform that can shift the country away from the normal politics we are used to. You say it's a missed opportunity. Is, is it too late? Can there be some partnership of some so, sort? So it's not too late. They said they are still talking. Mm -hmm. But these attributes have not changed. They are still who they are. You're, what I said is, who is going to sit with them? Mm. Who is going to broker this partnership? Because on their own, I can tell you, Peter will not step down for Konkosu. Neither will Konkosu step down for Peter Obi. Their history is very clear to me. But a broker, some form of group, elders, northern elders, southern elders, Nigerian interest group, any interest group that have the respect that these people can give, will bring them together in the interest of Nigeria and put them together. In that case, we will have a very interesting contest because the APC has taken a space as a ruling party and they have a very, very robust candidate. I must tell you, Tinubu is one of the best politicians we have today in Africa. Atiku had a pedigree of contest four times and have built structure and followings over time. So we, I will prefer to see this two match together and we go into the contest as a triangle. And let's see what people will choose. Interesting. Well, you know, much as yet, Kano has always been known for its huge quantum of voters. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes the figures are sometimes viewed with distrust. Mm. Um, and then when you also look at the number of discarded uh, votes, because we understand that over 2 million people were registered as, uh, were validated to vote but, yeah. on, on election day and over 78,000 votes were discarded. Do you think, one, that INEC is doing enough with voter education, and two, in the area of underage voting, mm. do you also think that, which is where you know, a lot of people usually have issues, yes. uh, uh, trust issues with votes that you know, are announced uh, from the North, do you think that they're also doing enough in that area of you know, bringing in trust into the system? So let me just address the issue of trust first. You remember before technology, uh, became available, our population census has been questioned. And when technology came, we could do biometrics. And then we started realizing that there is a semblance of a truth in some of the figures we have, because there are three things that confirm them. First of all, when you register INEC voters, it's a proportion, 40, 50% of the population. So when you have 5 million voters and another state have 2 million voters, you know the population is different. Lagos, for example, clearly showed that they are populated city. Kanu has shown. Kotaku is showing. Kaduna is showing. So there is element of truth in the people. Now, technology also has come in to verify people's reality in voting. So when people are going to vote, it's actual vote. In today's vote, 2023, you cannot vote twice because it's a machine vote. It will pick you up. So we're getting more and more refined in our vote. But when you have five to six million registered voters on register, and then two million votes comes out of it, I don't think there is any alarm in terms of proportion of voters that actually voted. Everywhere in the world, registered voters, you get about 40, maximum 45, 50% turnout. So you expect 2 million. You expect 3.5 million. If you get 4.5 million, you could like, no, 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 something's corrupt. The issue of underage voters, 
I don't know what INEC has done today, but I also know that a lot of NGOs and civil society have engaged the system to basically look out for any underage voters. And government itself is saying credibility of these elections have been questioned. We ourselves in Kanu are saying, look, do not mess up our reputation by bringing young children and just lining them up to vote because they are not at the voting age. So there are a lot of effort going on to clean up the system. In terms of real people voting, I think it's real. In terms of underage voting, we have a lot of work to do. Well, I think it's a fine place to leave it. Thank Mwaz you. Magaji, thank you so much for coming on Hard Copy. Thank you so much for having me. Well, that's our program tonight. If you'd like to speak to us, use the handles showing on your screen. Thank you for watching. I'm Malpo Yusuf. Good night.